we are proud to welcome back our returning panelist, uh, Don Moldy. Don is a retired physician and has worked extensively in wildlife activism and converse, conservation, working uh, both as the uh, Nevada um, Wildlife Conservation League and the Defenders of Wildlife program. Don is also the chair of our conservation committee. Before I turn it over to Don and his excellent presentation on flycatchers, I have a couple of housekeeping updates. Uh, during, we have started a webinar presentation, so therefore we will no longer be able to hear your vocals or your uh, microphones during the presentation. However, we do encourage you, if you have any questions for Don, please feel free to ask them. You can submit them using the Q&A button that is located on the bottom of your webinar screen. Click it, it'll enable you to send a message, and then uh, we will be having a Q&A session with Don after his presentation is finished. With all that said and done, please take it away, Don. All right, thank you, uh, Parker. Let's see if we can get this going. I think we're gonna be successful. Uh, so yeah, there we go. Let me take a minute to do a little something uh, with my screen. Well, anyway, uh, thank you all for stopping by on this uh, summer afternoon. Uh, it's always fun to chat about birds um, and particularly flycatchers, I guess, since uh, uh, some people regard them as kind of pesky uh, things that are uh, a problem to identify and maybe best avoided. Uh, I'm going to, oops, my dog is barking. I'm going to shut my door for a second. Um, there we go. Uh, so I thought what we would do is I just like to use flycatchers as a kind of example of how uh, people might go about birding, the way birders might learn how to do identification and what they might think about and how um, uh, one might get better. And so hopefully this is just kind of a general discussion about birding in a way, just using flycatchers as the case in point uh, to, um, um, to do that. And uh, let me, uh, with that, start here. Now, uh, this is slide is a bit of a joke because obviously these two birds, <laughs> none of which live in this country, are flycatchers. And my caption is, if it was this easy, uh, we wouldn't have this presentation. Uh, so obviously uh, it's not. So uh, flycatchers, you can see them um, pretty much all over the state. Um, uh, we, um, uh, no matter where you go, or, um, uh, north or south Nevada, over in eastern Nevada, you'll have a good chance to see uh, some of the birds we're going to be talking about. And uh, this uh, picture, which I use for other purposes, is a road up to a place called Lye Creek Campground in the Santa Rosa Mountains, uh, north of Winnemucca, which is a fine place to go for flycatchers if you uh, have an interest in camping out and uh, doing a little outing. Uh, this picture is a bit of a joke as well in that this is me many years ago on a sailboat trip uh, when before GPS and we were using sextants to uh, decide where we were. And the reason I'm showing this is in a way the sextant is kind of like a pair of binoculars. It, it's very useful for certain things, but the sextant is no good uh, if you don't know what ocean you're in. So if I were using the sextant thinking I was in the Atlantic Ocean, but I was really in the Pacific Ocean, then uh, I'm not going to wind up uh, where I think I am. And similarly, binoculars are kind of like um, um, the sextant. And the trick uh, to start out in birding is to kind of figure out which ocean of birds, if you will, you're in. Are you you know, looking at raptors and eagles and hawks and falcons, that's pretty easy, or shorebirds or, you know, or ducks, geese, waterfowl. Those are easy categories. But it's trickier when you get into the smaller birds and, you know, flycatchers are one of that group. So uh, we'll talk a bit about uh, flycatchers, uh, where they aren't. Uh, with the birds we're going to talk about tonight, you won't see them at your bird feeders. They don't soar like swallows. They're not going to be lounging in the grass. Uh, but basically where they are going to be 
or where there are you know, trees, fences, and shrubs, that sort of thing. And the way that you're probably going to catch on to uh, the idea that you might be looking at a flycatcher for the first time is that you may see a kind of a dark looking bird uh, perched uh, fairly low um, off the ground, uh, maybe in the shade on the end of a branch. And then as you're looking at it, you'll see it fly out a little bit, maybe uh, 10, 12, 15 feet. Uh, and then make a U-turn and come back to the same perch or one very close by. And so what the bird has done is gone out and caught a bug and come back, or at least tried to catch a bug. And when you see that, that bird that, uh, and these birds are not large, as we'll see, they're probably sparrow-sized or even smaller. Uh, when you see that bird fly out from a perch and come back, that should give you a clue, aha, uh -huh, I think I'm on to a flycatcher. Then you can start uh, the little process we'll be talking about here uh, shortly. So uh, this is another little joke. This is not a flycatcher. <laughs> if uh, flycatchers look like this, we'd all be uh, experts in a hurry. Uh, so what's a flycatcher? Well, the definition is that it's a uh, bird that uh, takes insects on the wing. Now that doesn't help us a lot, I guess, but uh, uh, the gray flycatcher uh, which is uh, one that we have regularly here during migration, is, is a little example of one. And uh, the great flycatcher, like most of the others, is a migrant. And the uh, blue areas um, show where the bird spends its winter, which is south of the border, pretty much. And then the, um, uh, the uh, uh, yellow is migration and the uh, uh, whatever that um, sort of... Uh, Rufus color is, is where the breeding uh, location is. So we have uh, uh, this uh, bird during the summertime uh, in our area. Now, uh, in my view, um, there's sort of like four ways to bird or to identify birds. You can sort of look at a bird. And if you know the bird, then obviously that's uh, perfectly reasonable. Uh, you can listen, uh, and I'm not good at that, I'm awful at that. So uh, I can learn a bird call one day and by the next weekend, uh, you know, it's escaped me. So I'm pretty much useless with respect to bird calls, but some people are excellent at it. And some birders, particularly back in the east where there's a lot of dense vegetation, actually go birding by ear. They don't bother to see the birds, they list the birds by the ones they hear. Uh, now you can also, decide about a bird's ID by watching it. And we're going to get into a little bit of that tonight. Or you can use all of the above. So let's take a look at uh, how, uh, one way to think about it. When I first started birding, um, somebody, I think one of the birders I worked with or was helping me told me, you know, first thing you do is look at the bill. The bill's going to tip you off uh, into what ocean of birds, so to speak, you're into. And uh, sometimes it does, although personally, I've never found bills all that helpful <laughs> except for this bird. Now, this bird is not a flycatcher, but if you were to try to describe to this bird, you saw this bird on an outing and you tried to describe it to your friends, it would be pretty hard to do. I mean, what, what, how are you gonna describe it? It's kind of a scroungy looking um, two-tone brown bird or something of that sort. I don't, I don't know how you would do it, but it has a very interesting characteristic that can be very helpful in identifying it. And if, my, if you can see my little pointer, the, uh, the beak, this is, happens to be a, a female brown-headed cowbird. And this bird gives a lot of birders uh, trouble, uh, particularly early birders starting out. It just is a very hard bird to, to identify because it has so little in the way of uh, standing out features, but it has this bill. And notice that the bill has a rather interesting slope to it. In other words, it doesn't have a, well, it, it has a rather straight line that goes up the bill and almost straight up the head. There's a little bit of a curve here, but the bill is straight to the forehead and then very little elevation here. It almost just continues straight onto the forehead without a forehead bump, so to speak, as compared to, uh, uh, if I can, uh, let's see, uh, if we can uh, take a look at this bird, 
Now this is a different bird, but I want the beak you notice is a little different, a different shaped beak, but also most of the beaks on birds have a little elevation on the forehead when they go up like this. And so uh, the beaks can be useful as you look at them. We'll come to another example later. Uh, so some birds, birders say, look at the beak. That's where you start. And I suppose, you know, uh, that's reasonable uh, discussion. Now, uh, I kind of look at the tail. I like to look at the tail end of the bird <laughs> so, because you can learn a lot from, um, from that as well. And here are two hummingbirds that came to my feeder um, three or four years ago and I had my camera out one day. Question is, Given what we have in front of us here with these two photographs, is there any way to tell if these are the same two hummingbirds or a uh, same species or are they two different species? And, you know, we have kind of a side view of the one on the left and uh, kind of a quarter back quarter view of the one on the right. And you might say, well, it kind of looks, they look different, but it's hard to be sure. But one of the ways that you can tell uh, is by looking at the tail. And uh, on the bird on the left, you notice that the tip of the tail falls quite a bit short of the end of the, I mean, the, the tip of the wing, I'm sorry. The tip of the wing falls short of the end of the tail by a noticeable amount. On this bird, although it's a little hard to tell from this angle, the tip of the wing is about the same length as the tail, the, the end of the tail. So one of the things that's helpful uh, in flycatchers and in other birds sometimes is where the tip of the wing falls relative to the rest of the tail. Uh, and we'll get into this a little bit further on. So some birders like to look at the bills to start. <laughs> I kind of like to look at the rear end of the bird just for the heck of it. And uh, you know, we'll make use of what, uh, what suits us. Now, with respect to, um, uh, uh, fly catchers. And by the way, uh, the, one of the reasons I got into fly catchers is because early on in my uh, birding uh, outings, I'd look at the, I'd run into fly catchers and they would puzzle me. So I'd go get the bird book out, thumb through it, get to fly catchers. And they would have photographs in the books. The books would have them and little arrows pointing here and there. And then after you read it up, read up on it a little bit, it would sort of say, well, don't try this at home. You know, these birds are so uh, similar that you just can't tell the difference. So even though they've got a book full of photographs and descriptions of the birds, they tell you, well, don't bother, you know, you can't do it. So that kind of caught my interest. I, I wasn't sure that was correct. So what I put together here is kind of a little guideline on how you might go about deciding uh, which flycatcher you're looking at. And in this area, the ones that I'm going to be talking about are only about seven or eight of them, that we don't have that many. <clears throat> and some of them are quite easy to identify, as I'll tell you in a minute. So this is my little uh, effort to come up with a decision tree, if you will, as to how to identify flycatchers while talking about what birders might use to make that decision. So uh, here are the birds that, that we're going to kind of talk about. We've got the Western Wood Peewee, which is by far and away the most common of the um, flycatchers that we're going to um, uh, wind up with. Uh, the Western flycatcher, some years can be quite common, some years not. The gray flycatcher is very common. Dusky uh, is a troublesome one. Uh, the Hammond's flycatcher is a fun one and rather uncommon. Uh, the willow, mm, you know, we see them here and there. And then uh, the olive side and a couple of others uh, we'll talk about as well. Uh, so the easiest one to talk about and to, to, to see is the, is the Western wood peewee, far and away, uh, the most common and the easiest by far in a, in a way to identify. <clears throat> and so <clears throat> the Western wood peewee uh, is the, one of those birds that you will see sitting on the edge of a branch, flying out a little distance, a few feet, turning around, coming back. <clears throat> it has a rather erect posture as the bird on the right uh, demonstrates. So it's pretty much straight up and down. <clears throat> it also was just kind of a nondescript um, brown color, but it does have in some photographs, not this one very well, it has a bit of a vest, what we call a vest, a little bit of white 
coming down the center of its chest with brown uh, next to the white. So it kind of looks like an open unbuttoned vest that somebody might wear. And <clears throat> it has a couple other uh, features that are quite helpful in its identification. One of which is on the bird on the right, the tip of the tail, I mean, I'm sorry, I can't get the tip of the wing, the tip of the wing is fairly long and extends down the tail a further distance than uh, most of the other flycatchers will talk about. So in a way, you can think of the wood peewee as a long winged bird. The tip of the tail extends quite a ways down the shaft, uh, the tip of the wing extends quite a ways down the shaft of the tail. Uh, the, other, the other thing that's interesting about the tail, as we'll see, is that uh, when the uh, when the peewee is perched, it does not flick its tail. It's one of the few birds that you know that I can think of. Well, anyway, some birds perhaps don't, but the peewee does not flick its tail compared to other flycatchers that do. So if you see the peewee sitting there, and you think it might be a peewee, look at the tail. And if the tail doesn't flick, if it doesn't go up, it doesn't go down from the midline position where it's shown on the right, then most likely this is gonna be a wood peewee. Also, uh, if you look at the head of the bird on the right, the peewee does not really have an eye ring. And we'll talk about eye rings here shortly. So the peewee does not have an eye ring. It has a rather long wing in the, the tip of the wing extends down the tail and the tail does not flick when you see it perched. That's a dead giveaway that it's a wood peewee. It's just uh, one of the easiest of the flycatchers uh, to identify because of those features. Now, <clears throat> we'll um, take a look at a few more pictures. The one on the picture on the left, far left over here shows the length of the wing tip quite nicely against the tail, sticks down quite a ways. In the center picture, you can also see the same thing, the tip of the tail, uh, the wing uh, sticks quite, quite a ways down. Also no eye ring on any of these. Uh, same with the bird over here. So now let's take a look at a peewee. And as you can see, it has a nice bill. The, the bill is good sized on the bird. It has a lot of orange on the bottom. But if you notice the tail, the tail's not flicking. Well, that's not a flick. It's, it's just uh, moving around a little. It does not flick its tail. Um, and if we uh, go on to this one, I think we'll get a little bit of its call. That's the peewee call. It's quite easy to hear. All right, so uh, uh, this is a uh, photograph taken by Fred Peterson, who was a birding friend of mine. He was here in Reno for many years. He was a great photographer, loved to take uh, birds photographs. And he took this uh, picture of a, um, <clears throat> of a, uh, was a peewee, wood peewee. Uh, that he uh, is allowing me to use. And I think this photograph uh, shows nicely where the tip of the wing extends down along the shaft of the tail quite nicely. Uh, it also shows quite nicely that it, this bird does not have an eye ring. Uh, and it's the bill is decent sized and uh, the bottom, the mandible is uh, sort of orange. Some birders like to make a lot out of the color of the lower part of the bill. Some birders have a fascination with wing bars and this hardly has anything. I don't really care much about any of this for flycatchers. With this bird, um, no eye ring, a long wing relative to the shaft of the tail and the tail that doesn't flick makes it a wood peewee. There's nothing else that it is. That, that's, you've got that one. Uh, ready to um, put away. Now, the next two that are also quite easy to identify that we'll talk about are the, the gray flycatcher and the so-called Western flycatcher. I'm using the term Western 
that uh, now has been subdivided into Cordillian and Pacific Slope, I think. I've forgotten the two subspecies that have been identified. But from my point of view, you can't tell the two apart. And uh, birders who know bird calls tell me that they can also make, mimic each other's bird calls sometimes. So I don't know how to identify the subcategories, but I can, I can uh, certainly uh, identify what we used to call the Western flycatcher and the two subspecies uh, look alike. So uh, let's take the, um, on the bird on the left first, let's have a look on, uh, on the, uh, uh, the gray flycatcher is over here. And um, one of the things that's interesting right away about the gray flycatcher is that if you look for the tip of the folded wing, relative to the length of the tail, you can see immediately that the gray flycatcher, we could say is a kind of a short winged bird. The tip of the wing does not extend down the shaft of the tail for any noticeable distance. Um, the uh, bird can have a little bit of an eye ring, but otherwise just looking at it, it's pretty nondescript. It's kind of a gray bird on the on the back and it's got kind of a light colored breast. By the way, the breast can also be a little yellow if it's a first year bird. Um, this one's got a bug in its beak, uh, but pretty hard to describe this bird to somebody else uh, just looking at its photograph. Now, the bird on the right, in contrast, is what I used to call and what I still do call the Western flycatcher. And there's kind of an immediate difference. Now, of course, this one's in the shade a little bit. This one's in the light. But one of the uh, first differences to notice is that the color of this bird is very different from this bird. And in fact, the Western flycatcher is the only flycatcher that you'll see around here that is olive and green and yellow for the most part. The other flycatchers are brown and gray and whatnot. So the Western flycatcher is a different colored bird, uh, olive, green, and yellow. And it also has a bit of an eye ring. We'll see this better in some of the other uh, uh, videos. Uh, interesting, it, can, it has a yellow kind of a belly to it. And as a sort of a subtle point, the width of the tail on the Western flycatcher is, is broader than what's the case with the gray or the dusky as we'll see. So it has kind of a wide tail, has some fairly short wing tips. It's got an eye ring and it also, the Western has a little bit of a peak to its head. We'll talk about that a little more later, kind of a V-shaped head. Whereas if you notice on the left, the gray flycatcher has more of a rounded head. There's not a really a crest uh, look to it as there is uh, with the uh, Western. So if we um, uh, take a little uh, further look at the gray, let's focus on the gray for the moment. Again, two photographs, you can see the sort of grayish, whitish, light gray color. Um, little bit of an eye ring, little bit of an eye ring right there. Uh, but you and, and then the short wingtips show up again. Uh, but other than that, uh, you'd be kind of hard pressed to be sure that this was a gray until you see it in action. And here, keep an eye on the tail. And the, the gray flycatcher flicks its tail in a very specific, just there, that a very specific way. The gray flycatcher never flicks its tail above the midline. It starts from the midline and moves its tail downward in a very deliberate flick. And then it moves its tail back to the midline. So um, the, uh, let me see, I think I have another one here. Um, so the tail flick, a behavioral activity, there it is. That's the tail. That's the tail flick. That flick right there is the gray tail flick. It is diagnostic of the bird. There is no other flycatcher that has a tail flick just like that. And notice it doesn't go above the midline. It comes back to the midline and it doesn't flick upwards like uh, the duskies. Do. So the gray flycatcher uh, then is a is extremely easy to identify when you 
have the general idea that it might be a gray and then you see the tail flick. The tail flick nails it. You have the bird. Now, this is one of Fred Peterson's photographs, uh, which is um, quite nice. And again, just shows the shorter uh, folded wingtips relative to the tail. And this one just has a trace of an eye ring. Sometimes the, the grays do not have any eye ring, sometimes just a little bit. And uh, grays have a fairly good sized bill compared to a couple of the other uh, flycatchers. Uh, so the, um, I think I'm, uh, Fred has a few other uh, kind of cool pictures of the gray. Uh, this one that he uh, did, and I think I uh, may have one other. Uh, yeah, here's a really a cool picture of a gray flycatcher up close and personal. Got a bug in its beak. You can see the gray has a pretty good sized beak. Uh, eye ring is pretty much absent. And again, the short uh, wing tips relative to the length of the tail. So the gray is very easy to identify based upon its behavioral characteristic of that, uh, that wing, uh, uh, the way it uh, tips its tail relative to the midline and back to the midline. Now, let's move on to the Western uh, flycatcher. Um, this bird is so much fun, in my opinion, mostly because it's very colorful. When you see a Western in the sun and you see that it's got yellow and olive and green, it is a Western by definition. There is no other uh, classification for it. But beyond that, it has this gorgeous eye ring. And it's, uh, it's not a circular eye ring, it's an elliptical eye ring for the most part. That's the way you see it in the out in, this one looks sort of circular in the middle, but if you look at the ones on the top and the side, the eye ring on a Western tends to be at the back of the eye, although it can go a little bit around the front, but it's what we would call an elliptical or a teardrop eye ring. And so when you see a yellow, green, and olive bird that's a flycatcher, and you see this gorgeous eye ring that's quite prominent, you'll see it easily. And also it has a little bit of a peak to its head. That's a Western flycatcher. There's nothing else it can be. No other flycatcher that we see around here is that color with that kind of an eye ring and a little crest to its head. That's a Western flycatcher. It's very easy to identify purely based on the color and also the eye ring. Uh, very, uh, when you see a few of them, particularly if you can catch one in good light, and get a good look at it, it you, you will nail it. It's, uh, it's not easily forgotten. They're very attractive little birds, as you'll see here in a minute. Um, yeah, look at that gorgeous character. I mean, just gorgeous. The eye ring, the coloring, uh, the bill. Is, it's got a good sized bill. It's got that nice crest. It raises its feathers on top of its head. The gray does not do that, nor does the peewee. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's about as nice a looking bird as you're gonna get. Um, and I think I have another one, a little different view. Now on this one, one of the things that's interesting is you can see the width of the tail. It has a broad tail, very short wingtips, by the way, as well. But the, uh, the width of the tail on the Western, although you don't really need it, the width of the tail is wider than the gray flycatcher or the dusky, which we'll come to shortly. Um, well, let's see, we've seen enough of the Westerns here. So let's go on. This is one of Fred Peterson's photographs of the Western. Uh, and uh, here's another. They're just beautiful birds in my opinion. And notice how short the wingtip is compared to the tail. Uh, and, and think back to the wood peewee, which has a much longer wingtip down here. So even if you saw nothing else on this bird except where the wingtips were located relative to the tail, you would know this can't be a wood peewee because the wingtips are way too short for a wood peewee. So even if you knew nothing else, you knew this is, this is not a wood peewee because the wingtips are too short. But anyway, we have all the other stuff, the coloring, the eye ring and all of that, nice looking bill. So that's a Western flycatcher, very easy to identify if you catch it in good light and uh, remember that it's uh, 
olive green and yellow and not gray and brown. So, so we have now covered three of these, uh, the wood peewee, the gray and the western. Then it gets slightly stickier. We have this um, flycatcher called the dusky. And as you can see, uh, particularly from the picture on the left, this one looks pretty much like the gray, the photographs that we showed you before uh, the uh, uh, of the gray flycatcher. And looking at this picture, there's no way I could tell, or anybody as far as I know, that this is a dusky instead of a gray flycatcher. Although the really subtle birders who are big on this would look at the bill and they would say, you know what? That bill looks a little bit too small for a gray flycatcher. That bill is too small for a gray flycatcher. So this one is probably a dusky. That's what, um, that's what somebody who's really familiar with, but you know what? You don't often get a look at the bill that's that good when the bird's flying around or moving. And sometimes it's hard to judge the size of the bill. So, <coughs> excuse me. So anyway, based on this picture, this bird is probably either a dusky or a gray. And the way we can sort it out is by watching its tail. And if the tail goes down and up and down and up, it's a gray. If the tail does all kinds of things, including going above the midline, then it's a dusky. That's basically the way that we can sort out, or I sort out, uh, the dusky from the gray. Now, here's on the right, this is also a dusky, but you notice that the belly of the bird is yellow. Now, first year flycatchers, duskies, grays, they can have yellow. The first year bird can have a yellow belly. Sometimes it's, this is pretty bright, some of it's more subtle, but it can fool you a little bit uh, if you see yellow and think, huh, this must be something else. First year birds can have a yellow belly. So don't let that throw you. And again, the short wingtips relative to the tail. And again, this bill, just a little bit smaller than a gray flycatcher's bill. It just looks like a smaller pointier bill. The, the gray has a nice husky bill. This one, the dusky does not. So let's look at a few more pictures of the dusky. Uh, and here again, see now this bill would be, it looks a little bigger. This one looks a little smaller. So the, you couldn't, you'd have trouble deciding totally or only by the bill what you're looking at. So the key in differentiating a dusky from a gray, because they kind of look the same, is what the tail does when you're watching the bird. So the behavioral characteristic, the tail flick, is very important in just sorting out these two birds, the gray versus the dusky. Uh, so now, here's the dusky. Notice the yellow on the belly, so this is a first year bird. And here's another one. Now just kind of watch this tail flick. This is, it's just kind of an odd, it's, it's not a, a deliberate tail flick in the, in the same sort of way. Some of it looks a little bit similar, but it'll also go above the midline if we were looking at the tail flick from the side. And so, and this dusky has a little bit of an eye ring. Uh, many of them don't, but you can have a little bit of an eye ring. And also in this uh, video, the bill looked a little small to me for a, uh, for a gray flycatcher. Here's a photograph of a dusky. And again, if you look at the bill and remember what the grays look like, uh, perhaps the gray has a bigger bill than this. So, the bill size can help sorting out the two birds and the tail flick helps. That's how we sort of separate out the gray and the dusky. Now, the Hammonds uh, is a really fun bird in my opinion. Um, it's, <laughs> it's not common. Um, they're uncommon, I would call them, although they're around or maybe they're sort of locally common if you have one around, you might see it a bit, but uh, there, um, it has, a, let's see, it has a little longer wing on the upper right corner. 
the tip of the folded wing extends down the tail uh, a bit further than the gray or the dusky that we were just looking at. It kind of resembles a little bit the peewee in terms of the tip of the wing being down the tail shaft a bit. However, it's quite different from the peewee in a couple of other ways. Uh, first of all, it has an eye ring, an elliptical eye ring. We'll see this better in some other photographs. The, the peewee does not have an eye ring. Also, the bill on the Hammonds is a very tiny, round, black bill. And that's a dead giveaway for the Hammonds uh, as compared to the other flycatchers we're talking. This little tiny black bill combined with a fairly long folded wingtip and an elliptical eye ring. And if you add to that a little bit of a tendency to crest its head, uh, that makes a Hammonds a pretty cool identification when you run into one. Now, here's a bunch more photographs of the Hammonds. Some of them have a very striking eye ring that's easy to see. And in this upper right corner, uh, the eye ring is very prominent, and you'll see the tiny little bill. It's really a small bill. And in the center photograph, again, a nice eye ring, a tiny bill, and the wingtips extend down the tail a bit further than what the gray and the dusky do. So the Hammonds, uh, let, I think I may have another, do I have another photograph? No, but here's the Hammonds uh, in real life. Um, you can see the eye ring, very nice. You can see the tiny bill, relatively tiny bill. And you can see that the wingtips are extending down the shaft of the tail a ways. And the wingtips on a Hammonds don't cross over the tail. They don't fold themselves like holding your hands. They stick straight out, parallel to the tail, which is helpful as well. Cool bird. If you see a Hammonds, you just got to give yourself a pat on the back. That makes your day. And uh, here's a kind of a fanciful uh, little video clip of a Hammonds. They like their little musical background and all of this. Notice that nice eye ring and that small bill. It has a, look at that little tiny bill. That is a dead giveaway on a Hammonds, the small bill. There's a nice view of the bill, how small it is. Another view of the bill. And the, uh, the elliptical eye ring is nicely seen here as well. I like this little video clip they did it so nicely. All right, so um, here's another of Fred Peterson's photographs of the Hammond. Um, again, the beautiful eye ring that the bird has, a little bit of a crest which is you often see on Hammonds, this black, small black bill, and then the fairly long uh, wingtips. Uh, so the Hammonds, when you see a couple of them, you sort of get the hang of it. And, uh, and I'll tell you a story about this bill um, and how birders use different things to identify birds. And then they can wind up arguing about the same bird as to whether it's, <laughs> it's that bird or not. Uh, one time uh, I was birding with a guy named Jack Walters, who used to be the best birder in Nevada, in my opinion. He pioneered a lot of Nevada birding. And I was a novice and he took me under his wing and uh, he uh, helped me with flycatchers. And one day we were down at uh, Corn Creek or what's now called the Desert National Wildlife Refuge, walking into the complex along a trail. And I turned to my left and I saw a Hammonds flycatcher sitting on the fence about oh, maybe 15 or 20 yards away. And all I could see was the back end of the bird because it was facing the other way. Uh, but I knew instantly it was a Hammonds uh, because of the way the wingtips uh, against the tail. Uh, and I could see a bit of a crest on the head. 
And I knew just from the back end of the bird, it was a Hammond. So I called to Jack ahead of me who hadn't seen the bird and said, hey, Jack, it looks like we've got a Hammond's on the fence. So he turned and, and looked at the bird. And then he turned and looked at me uh, with an eyebrow raised like, are you crazy? You can't call a Hammond's from here uh, with that view. So he, um, you know, to, to humor me, he walked out into the grassy area towards the fence and he was able to maneuver around and get a look at the front end of the bird. And it had this small, tiny, black, round bill. And so, and he probably saw the eye ring too, but he saw the bill. So he came back and said, ah, you think you're pretty smart, I suppose. I said, well, I don't know about that, but it's a Hammonds. And, and so here's, so I'm up against this terrific birder. I'm using ID features from the back end of the bird to know what I'm looking at. He won't make an identification until he sees the bill. We're talking about the same bird. I don't care if I see the bill. It's nice to see the bill, but I don't need it. He needed the bill. So my point is that birders sometimes get into interesting discussions about ID of birds when without sort of knowing it, they're both using different features to uh, sort of uh, promote their uh, idea about the identification of the bird and get into some crazy arguments about birds because I'm using the rear end of a bird and he's looking at the front end. Anyway, uh, that's part of the fun of birding, I suppose. And that's why we play around with these uh, subtleties on these kinds of birds that are hard to identify otherwise. Okay, so uh, moving on, uh, we have the willow flycatcher, which we have around here on occasion. Now the willow is a big one. It's bigger, it's just a bigger bird. It also has a very prominent peaked head uh, that's almost always seen. Uh, in these photographs on the left and the right. It also has very short wingtips relative to the tail and a broad tail. It also does not have an eye ring. So, uh, and if you add to that a really big bill, although it doesn't quite show it in this photograph, the willow is fairly easy to separate from a gray or a dusky because it looks more brown than gray. And it's also a bigger looking bird with a peaked head. So the willow, um, here's some more shots of a willow, um, just to give you some idea, uh, we'll see a couple of video clips. Uh, the peaked head and the relatively short wingtips, again, uh, help us decide that it might be a willow. So let's take a look at some willows here. And of course, there's the famous call of the willow, Fitzview, Fitzview. So they say, anyway. It's got a good sized bill. Notice no eye ring. Look at how short the wing tips are compared to the length and sort of a short tail, a wide tail. And kind of a big looking bird. It's bigger than the grays and the duskies, the way it appears. Fitzview. And there's another of its calls. There we go, Fitzview. Yeah, all right. So uh, here's another one. And in this one, you can get an idea that its bill is a pretty good sized bill. Uh, and it is in the yellow, the mandible is entirely yellow. And when you see it from the bottom looking up, it looks like a big bill for the bird. It, it is a prominent bill, bigger than, uh, far bigger than the Hammond says, for example. And you can see the kind of the crest of the head tends to be a, a, a peaked crested look to it. So just to kind of review at the moment, uh, which two flycatchers can identify by tail flick? And, well, we know you can identify the gray because it flicks its tail in a very specific way, down, up to the midline, down, up to the midline, never the other way. And of course the wood peewee, which does not flick its tail at all. So the behavioral um, observations of the tail flick or lack of one 
are two easy ways to identify two of these flycatchers we're talking about. And then the eye, the elliptical eye ring, which you can see very easily. Uh, it's a very prominent um, observation most of the time. The elliptical eye ring is very characteristic of the Western flycatcher. And of course, if you combine that with its green, yellow, olive look, that's what it is. It's a Western. And then the Hammonds has the elliptical uh, eye ring that helps uh, with the ID for that bird as well. So the eye rings and the tail flicks. Also the head shape, we've talked a little bit about that. The gray and the dusky on the left tend to have fairly smooth round head shapes uh, without much of a, a, a deviation, pretty much round. But the willow and the western, and we'll get to a couple more, have a very peaked V-shaped more V-shaped head with the feathers fluffing up as you watch them, which tells you that these are not grays or duskies because the head shape is different. So we're, we're looking for willows or westerns. And then of course, we just talked a little bit about the wing length, if you wanna call it that. That is the position of the tip of the folded wing against the shaft of the tail. And the long wing, we know, characterizes Hammonds and later olive-sided and also Western wood peewees. And here's a really dramatic view from this angle of how the wingtip can stick way down along the tail. Sometimes you get that view. And on the right-hand side, this is a willow and you can see how short the wingtip is relative to, the, it doesn't even get to the base of the tail. That's a big tip off uh, for a willow. And here's another on the far right upper, another example of how short the wingtip is relative to the length of the tail. So these features are quite helpful. Uh, now, here's an olive-sided flycatcher. And the olive-sided flycatcher is kind of like a big wood peewee. They're in the same family. And uh, you can maybe guess that by this gorgeous center photograph, which shows the very long wings that the olive-sided bird has relative uh, to the uh, the others we've talked about. But the big giveaway on an olive-sided flycatcher is this vest that it has, the so-called vest with the white center and then darker shading on the sides. This is very prominent, as well as its huge bill. And generally, you'll see these olive-sided flycatchers sitting way up in the top of a snag. You're not going to see these down uh, in a bush or uh, in a low branch on a tree you're gonna see these guys sitting way up at the top of a tree or on top of a snag, looking just about like the center photograph shows you. They're very, uh, they're big bird, bigger than anything we've looked at so far. <clears throat> and they stand out. Uh, and when you see this vest, that's a giveaway. Almost, that, that almost nothing else counts. When you see this vest in a big bird like this, that's an olive-sided flycatcher. Here's a couple more photographs on the right and the left. Very striking bird, big bird. Uh, you just, one of those that you just uh, can't miss. So here's um, an olive-sided flycatcher. And you can see the, the breast, the vest rather. Uh, you can see how big the bill is on the olive-sided. It's a really big bill. And you can see the long wings. Uh, sticking way down. And it has a characteristic call, which we uh, will get to in a minute here. I think it's on the next video clip. There we go. Quick three beers. Quick three beers. That's what some birders claim that this bird is saying three beers. So when you see a bird that looks like this, big vest, a big bird, long wings, big bill singing quick three beers, <laughs> there's no doubt that you're looking at uh, this, uh, this bird. It's quite striking and once you see one or after the second one you'll never forget it again. Uh, and so thanks again to Fred Peterson. Uh, for providing this gorgeous shot of, uh, of this bird. 
Again, uh, the long wingtips, you can see the vest is very prominent and this very large bill uh, on this big bird. It's quite a dramatic bird. And we see them around here, Oxbow and other places, perched way up on the top of the tree. Now, I saw one of these birds today out at um, Carson Lake. Now, this is the ash-throated flycatcher. And to me, this is the most handsome of all the flycatchers that we have in Nevada. <laughs> it's just my favorite, personal favorite. They're more common in the south, uh, around Las Vegas and so on. But we have them up here. And I, like I said, I saw one today out in Fallon. And they uh, have a different posture. They kind of sit forward a little bit. They have this rufous or brownish looking patch on their wing, which is quite characteristic. They always pretty much have a crested head. Sometimes it really stands up as we'll see. They have a pretty good sized bill, although it's kind of pointed, it's quite pointed, uh, and then kind of a pale breast. Um, and they're often described as unmistakable, although you've got to kind of get used to looking at them, but they are a one gorgeous bird. Um, here's, um, <laughs> I think this is my lousy photograph, actually. Uh, I can't see the eye very well, but you can see the how they raise the feathers on the top of their head to make the head look uh, very V-shaped. Uh, the bill, a little bit of the rufous color here. They're just a dramatic, uh, striking bird that you look at and say, wow, this is not a gray or a dusky flycatcher. Now, here's one. Now you notice on this one, the bird hasn't elevated its head feathers uh, yet, uh, or it may or may not. The tail's a little bit rufous as well. We don't see that very well on this one. Um, so I don't know if I forgot it, but, uh, oh, here we go. Uh, this one has its call. This is, now look at how gorgeous this bird is. Tell me this is not a beautiful bird. Uh, notice the feathers puffed up. Here's the rufous on the wings. Take a quick look at the bill before we go on to the next one. Uh, well, that's probably not the best angle. But uh, let me show you um, this, uh, now one more bird. This is one more, this is one of Fred Peterson's shots of an ash-throated flycatcher. Gorgeous bird, notice all this. A little bit of rufous here, a little bit on the wing, not much on the wing. The crusted head, the beautiful beak. And take a careful look, take a careful look at this beak because we'll need this, uh, your recollection on this in a minute. Also notice the relatively short wingtips relative to the length of the tail. Uh, like most flycatchers, other than peewees and hammonds, most flycatchers have very short wingtips. Uh, relative to the tail. Okay, now take a look at this bird. Question is, is this the same bird we were just looking at or is this a different bird? And I'll give you a tip. What's going to tell you that is the bill. And if we um, look at that bill, that is a much bigger bill than the ash-throated flycatcher, even though the bird looks relatively the same. I wonder if I can go backwards on this. I think I can. Uh, let me go back. So take a look at this bill and this bird, but the bill. And then take a look at that bill. Clearly, this is a different bird. And this turns out to be a brown crested flycatcher, which we also have in Nevada. We don't have them up here. I've never seen one up in the north, although they may occur. The furthest north that I've seen them is Paranagat or in Beatty one time. But generally I've seen them in Las Vegas. In fact, one time I was lucky enough to have an ash-throated flycatcher and this brown-crusted flycatcher in the same tree at the same time, which gave a really nice opportunity to compare the two birds. And this bird's a little bigger than the ash-throated. It's a heftier, bigger bird. Uh, gorgeous bird, love these uh, crested flycatchers. Now, this bird, if you look at the bill compared to the two bills we've been looking at, this one's even a little different. This one is not a big round bill that comes out to an end and it has a little different taper than the one we were looking at. This bird 
is called the Great Crested Flycatcher. This photograph was taken by Fred Peterson at Miller's Rest Stop north of Tonopah uh, four, three or four years ago. Fred was lucky enough to be there when this bird showed. This is an Eastern bird. We don't have the Great Crested in this state. And one of the things that makes it different is this brilliant yellow um, breast that it has, uh, the characteristic of the Great Crested, just gorgeous yellow breast, but also the bill it has a different shape than the other two that I just showed you, sort of a subtle difference, but a difference. Anyway, Fred was lucky enough to be there that day and, ca and capture that photograph, which uh, I'm gonna pass over the least. Uh, that's not seen very often. Uh, here's a says Phoebe, just to get back to a few common ones. I'm sure some of you have seen these. The giveaway on a says Phoebe is this pumpkin color to its tummy, to its breast. If you see a flycatcher looking bird and you see a pumpkin color, that's a says Phoebe, nothing else. Also, this, notice how small the bill is on the says Phoebe since we've been talking bills. It's almost a needle-like bill. It's not a large bill compared to uh, say the, the, the gray flycatcher or uh, the olive sided or something of that sort. Um, here's Fred, <laughs> this is a Fred Peterson photograph, his rendition of a, uh, of a, um, the Phoebe. And I don't know how he got this, but you can see the, you can see a little bit of the pumpkin color along the side here, which is, it's an amazing photograph. <laughs> Uh, it looks weird. Um, anyway, all right. So uh, the black Phoebe, I just threw this in so everybody could say, oh yeah, I've seen that one. I know that one. And Fred has a picture of, that's an unmistakable bird. That's one of those called unmistakable. Uh, you don't need much to know about them. Now I threw in the vermilion flycatcher uh, because while everybody knows this one on the right, the male, let me tell you, this one on the left can catch you off guard if you're not thinking about a female vermilion flycatcher. If you see this bird sitting all by itself, uh, you can wind up scratching your head for a while trying to decide, hmm, what is that? But if the two are together, then it's obvious. So with the vermilion, everybody knows the male. The female can uh, cause you some heartburn until you happen to think of it. And here's one of Fred's gorgeous photographs of the uh, male vermilion flycatcher. So um, we're getting to the end here. Uh, I hope by now that uh, you know that none of these birds on this screen are flycatchers. <laughs> these are something other than flycatchers. That's kind of a joke. And we're back to uh, the original peewee picture that I showed you. Just as a reminder, you know, nice bill, no eye ring, uh, tip of the wing down along the tail. Uh, this is the most common bird that you'll see. Uh, and once you see it, you'll know it forever. Uh, I just want to mention this book, um, this book called Birding on Borrowed Time by Phoebe Snetzinger is a, uh, is a fun read because Phoebe Snetzinger is the first human being uh, since the beginning of time to see over 8,000 bird species in her life. Others have done it since then, but Phoebe was the first. And she didn't start birding until she was 34 years old when she was in her kitchen one day in the spring in the Midwest. Uh, she looked out the window and she saw this bird. Uh, and she went, wow, what is that bird? Uh, she had a neighbor there who knew the bird, a male black Bernian warbler in full breeding plumage. Phoebe said, I've got to start this. And fortunately, Phoebe had a trust fund from her dad. So she was not without resources. And when she finally died in a bus crash in Madagascar, uh, chasing another bird, she had accumulated over 8,000 species that she had actually seen. So if you want to uh, find out how a birder does that and have an entertaining tale, uh, get Phoebe's book. Uh, so anyway, let's uh, call it the end. This is a little, this little rascal in the picture here is a, is a northern bearded tyrannulate, which we don't have in this state. But I put it in here to remind me and you that perseverance 
is part of birding. And it took me about a month to get a picture of this terranulate. It was down, we were down in uh, the Rio Grande Valley at the end, uh, there was a, a state park, I've forgotten, it's no, a county park. This terranulate and some others lived in this bush and we could hear them and vaguely see them. And it took, I don't know, it took me a long time to get this lousy picture of this bird. So the message is that if you're gonna do some birding, don't get discouraged <laughs> if, uh, uh, first, you know, first time out, you don't see everything you want. Stick with it and your chances will improve. So uh, with that, I think I'm done. Um, so Parker, uh, take it away or let's see if we have anything. Yes, uh, right now uh, we don't have any questions uh, yet in the Q&A. Uh, I haven't seen any uh, ones, yes. <clears throat> okay, okay. I'll let that open for a little while. And uh, anyways, um, yeah, so, um, um, well, I have a question then. Uh, um, what are, uh, what's the most common uh, um, Phoebe species that you have seen, say, in uh, the Washoe County region of Nevada? Which, which common uh, uh, flycatcher, you mean? Or, or yeah, what are we thinking? Flycatcher species. Well, you know, clearly the wood pea. Well, I haven't talked about some other birds that we could reasonably call flycatchers, such as the Western kingbird, uh, for example. I haven't included that in here because they're so easy to identify. Uh, uh, so something like a Western kingbird, I think, would probably be the most common, I would guess. But with respect to the birds that we looked at, and actually, just uh, also because it is common, the Western wood peewee is by far and away the, the most common of the birds that we've looked at tonight. It, it, it's every year they're around. And, and once you get on to recognizing a peewee, you see them all the time. And some years, um, less common, but still fairly um, noticeable, is the gray flycatcher. So the Western wood peewee and, and then the gray flycatcher most years is, is like number two and fairly common. Once in a while, I've had a couple of years where the Western flycatcher was the number two behind the peewee. We just had a bunch of Westerns um, all over the place. Everywhere you went, there was a Western flycatcher. It was quite remarkable because that doesn't happen very often. But I think in terms of common birds um, that, that we looked at on the screen, uh, the Western wood pea and, uh, peewee and the gray flycatcher are the two that you're most likely to see uh, without, you know, uh, uh, working a bit at it. And you can see those at Oxbow. You can see them at Rancho San Rafael. You can see them at uh, Davis Creek uh, County Park. You can see them almost anywhere. Uh, but if anybody likes to do an outing, go up to the Santa Rosas to the Lye Creek Campground north of Paradise set your tent up or your RV and uh, man, you'll have fun looking at peewees and other flycatchers up there. It's a great place to go. So that's sort of my take on that. Thank you, Don, yes. Uh... Let's see, uh, any more questions? Uh, if you have any questions, uh... Um, ah, okay, I have one. It says, excellent presentation. Does habitat help to identify flycatchers? Uh, well, uh, yes and no. I mean, uh, you're not going to, I wouldn't, um, uh, you, you wouldn't look for flycatchers, particularly around a lake, I mean, a, a swampy area or something, unless there was some uh, vegetation like tall shrubs or trees, you know, around the perimeter of it. I th uh, so I would mostly look in habitat like parks, like Oxbow, like San Rafael, like Davis Creek. Um, um, they're, they're not going to be out in the open. If you're out in the middle of an open field, you're not going to have any flycatchers out there. Um, you're not going to have flycatchers around your bird feeders because they don't eat bird seed. So you have to kind of get off the sofa and head out to uh, some of that kind of vegetation like Oxbow uh, to have the best chance, yeah. 
Great answer. Uh, and if I may add, yes, uh, I have seen them in the parks around in Reno uh, as well. They're, as you said, uh, not in your uh, backyard, but definitely around. Uh, if you just get off and take a walk, you can easily find them in the shrubs. Uh, I've gotten uh, multiple uh, um, comments that uh, are praising you with words like outstanding, really helpful, uh, excellent presentation. Thank you so much, Don. Uh, yeah, um, does anybody else have any questions? Uh, feel free to ask them with the Q&A button. And also, uh, by the way, uh, if anybody wants to contact me, uh, uh, you know, my email uh, works, sky, skyshrink at AOL.com. I'm happy to respond to emails as best I can, you know, as, uh, as well. So, uh, and I do want to thank Fred Peterson for the use of his photographs. Uh, Fred moved out of town. He's up in Portland now. Uh, but he was a great birder here in Nevada. And uh, I miss him greatly, particularly his, uh, his photographs. Uh, I might add, by the way, that if somebody wants to really do what we used to call Nevada birding, uh, you need to spend a little time in the south. Uh, probably in some respects, the best birding in Nevada is from Tonopah South. Uh, Northern Nevada um, is more somehow more limited. It just doesn't work out this way. And probably on any given day during migration, the best birding spot in Nevada which is actually world-class, is the visitor center at the Desert National Wildlife Refuge, or what we used to call Corn Creek. It's on Corn Creek Road. It's about 30 miles, 20 miles north of Las Vegas. Um, it's um, just um, south be between Indian Springs and the uh, north end of Las Vegas. It's uh, to the east of uh, Highway 95. It is spectacular, and right now, People are just raving about the bird activity down there. So uh, if you can happen to be going to Las Vegas in the next uh, six weeks, uh, take a little time, turn left on Corn Creek Road and go out to, Corn, uh, to uh, that visitor center. And uh, you may have a spectacle that you will tell your friends about. I can, I can tell you that. Thank you, Don. OK, we have one last question, which is, uh, have you observed any flycatcher species common around hot springs? Oh yeah, you could have, yes. Well, I don't go to hot springs that much, but with shrubbery around hot springs, sure. You could have uh, peewees. I would think uh, wood peewees, you could be seen there, probably gray flycatchers uh, would, yes. Yeah, so you could see flycatchers around hot springs. Yes, particularly with vegetation around the perimeter that would be suitable for perching. Uh, yes, you could see those, sure, sure. Wonderful. Well, again, thank you so much, Don, for providing this presentation tonight. Uh, I'm sure if we'd be in person, everybody would be giving you a thunderous applause for your work. Well, thanks for showing up, folks, and we'll do it again another time. Definitely, definitely. And uh, on behalf of all of us from La Hontan Audubon Society, thank you for taking time this evening and tuning in to our presentation. And, uh, we are, will be continuing this series and we will be continuing it next week with a presentation of Backyard Birds with Alan Gubanek. Uh, if you would like to register, uh, feel free to visit our website on a calendar and you will see our uh, Alan's talk listed where you can register and uh, it'll be as simple as registering for this presentation with Don. Anyways, thank you so much everyone and have a great night. All right, yes, thank you. <laughs>